This episode of Other People's Airplanes is supported by Piper and Sennheiser. It's day four of EAA's AirVenture Oshkosh 2011, and today we are bringing you ultralights. A little bit gloomy, but I don't think we really care because we're around airplanes. So uh, let's do this. Today, we are in the ultralight section. So much awesome stuff happening around here. Yesterday was a bit of a wash. It rained quite a bit of the day, so we didn't get a whole lot of filming done. But today, we're going to bring you other people's airplanes right from the area over here. We're also going to bring you the 100 seconds for 100 years of naval aviation and, of course, a youth aviation spotlight. So what do you say we get to it? I'm here with Dale Kramer, the designer and manufacturer of Laser Aircraft over here in the ultralight area. And we're going to talk to uh, Dale about the Laser plane we see right behind us. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you um, for having me. So tell me a little bit about the history of Laser as a company and as an airplane. You designed this. Yes. Uh, uh, 32 years ago, I was in aerospace engineering and uh, decided that I it was a new dawning of a new era and in, uh, in aviation and I quit university and designed the laser and uh, never looked back I ended up building 1200 airplanes in uh, between 1979 and 1985 what was the 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 idea behind the airplane why why choose you know, why did you design the airplane this way what were you trying to what, what was your mission well uh, originally my mission was uh, looking at they were putting motors on hang gliders at the time and I ha had a aviation background and I was a glider pilot, sailplane pilot, uh, was what I did in the summers. And I wanted a sailplane, that uh, an airplane, more of an airplane and a sailplane to fly in the same realm as the powered hang gliders. So I designed uh, basically a powered glider. The original airplane had only two five and a half horsepower motors on it. And, uh, and we started building them. So. And the original airplane had five and a half horsepower piston in piston engines on it, but this is a little bit different. What happened here? Well, uh, for the last ten years, I've been trying to electrify a laser, put, put electric motors on it, and uh, and see if I could get rid of the messy, gassy, finicky little things we had on there before. Even though they were necessary for what we needed to do with them, and we we put up with it. Electric's always been my dream, so I. Uh, uh, this this February, I decided uh, that after having tried it three times in the last ten years, this was the time that was going to work because the technology and the hardware was there that I needed. Funny how the technology finally catches up to what we want to do, isn't it? Oh, it's uh, it's uh, technology is 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 there to be used. Tell us a little bit about the performance of this particular aircraft. Well, it's unique in that I, I believe it's the first electric amphibious aircraft, and for first electric seaplane, um, and it takes off and lands on water, and uh, water or land. So uh, I brought it to here to Oshkosh to try to inspire people to re show people that electric aircraft are practical and can be made in any configuration. Well, ultralights are cer certainly known for their innovation and this is nothing short of incredible so thank you so much for taking the time to show us this airplane thank you very much hi this is damon and today i'm joined by andrew king the pilot of the curtis pusher how are you doing today andrew very good thanks tell me a little bit about the curtis pusher well, this airplane, it's a replica of the very first airplane to land and take off on a ship 100 years ago in 1911. What's it like to fly? It uh, is a lousy flying airplane, <laughs> frankly. It flies, I guess, like a 100-year-old airplane is supposed to fly. It's very sensitive in pitch, and it's, over con it's easy to over-control in pitch. The ailerons are very heavy, and roll is very slow. Uh, the rudder's pretty normal, but that's about it. But everything else is, is a lot of work. How do you get involved in a project like this? Well, the airplane was built by a man named Bob Coolbaugh in Newmarket, Virginia, uh, finished last October. 
he, he had just retired from the airline, spent about two and a half years building it, and I was a good friend of Bob's. I've known him for many years and have helped him rebuild his monocoupe and some other airplanes that we've worked on. So uh, I grew up at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in New York and, and have been around Curtis Pushers before, and so it was kind of natural for me to be involved in this project. What impact do you think this aircraft had on naval aviation? This aircraft is extraordinarily significant. It's the, it represents the birth of naval aviation. It was the first landing and takeoff on a ship. And it, the Navy, it was the Navy's idea. It's interesting, Eugene Ely, who was the pilot, was a civilian, and it was a civilian-owned airplane, but it was the Navy's idea, and they approached Glenn Curtis and, and suggested the idea as an experiment. They started to realize that it would be handy to have airplanes on ships where they could fly off and find the enemy before the enemy could find them. And so this was the, the end result of that, that idea, and as I say, it represents the very birth of naval aviation. Were there any uh, big challenges you had to overcome in a project like this? Well, there was, there was a lot of little challenges. There weren't any big challenges. There were actually plans surviving for a very close version of the Curtis Pusher, so we only had to make a few modifications to those drawings in order to, to represent Eugene Ely's airplane. Uh, the, the big challenges have just been the, the knuckle down and work and, and trying to get it here. It flies 55 miles an hour and we can only go about an hour at a time. The pilot can only stand to sit in it for about an hour. And so flying it here all the way from New York, I think we made 16 stops from New York. And, uh, and it was, you know, it's just hard work is all it is. And your favorite thing about being involved with the Curtis Pusher? Well, uh, that's a good question. The favorite thing, it's, it's satisfying that it's had so much interest in it, I guess. So we go places and people just flock around it. We did a show in Detroit, the, War the Thunder Over Michigan Warbird show, and people just flocked around the Curtis Pusher, and there were Corsairs and Japanese Zeros and stuff. And, and so it's so unique, it just draws a lot of interest, and we get to kind of spread the story of naval aviation and the birth of naval aviation, and so it's very satisfying. I tell people, we didn't do it for fun, because a lot of times it's not fun. We did it for satisfaction, and we've gotten a lot of satisfaction out of it. Well, there you have it, the Curtis Pusher, the first naval aircraft. I'm Damon Favor, and that's your 100 seconds. I'm over here in Hangar D, and I've caught up with, with Dan Kaiser and, and Steve Wathen with Youth Aviation Adventure, and this is just a really neat youth organization. Thanks for coming and, and talking to us here on Other People's Airplanes. Steve, would you tell us a little bit about Youth Aviation Adventure? Sure. Uh, youth Aviation Adventure is uh, now a national program. Dan and I uh, started 14 years ago just helping a few kids in our local community get their aviation merit badge. The program kept growing. One day we had 70 kids show up. Uh, a couple years later we had 477 show up. And at that point we realized we had something uh, where there was demand. There were kids who wanted to learn more about aviation and aviation careers. Uh, so we uh, teamed up with Ohio State University to produce a professional curriculum and essentially have developed what is a, a half day program. Uh, it's usually conducted at Saturday mornings at local airports. It's um, it's like a, a ground school for kids, essentially. And uh, we've uh, modularized it, if you will, packaged it up so that it can be repeated very easily in other markets, uh, prepackaged curriculum, all the materials people need. We provide it free of charge to any group, EA squadrons, uh, flying clubs, FBOs, anyone willing to put the program on as a, on a sustainable basis, repeat it year after year in their market. Uh, we, again, support them free of charge. We're an all-volunteer organization. We're 501c3, and uh, we're uh, here at Oshkosh to promote our program and, and grow and continue to grow as much as we can. So tell me a little bit about um, the, the, what, what actually happens at, at this weekend, this, this half-day program. Well, the uh, kids come to us and we break them out into 10 groups. We have 10 stations, 10 learning stations. Each learning station is an aviation topic such as aerodynamics, pre-flight, uh, instruments, etc. And the kids cycle, they spend 20 minutes of each, at each of those 10 stations and they learn a little bit about obviously the, the topic of that station. Uh, the whole program takes about five hours to complete. Uh, the Boy Scouts in the crowd earn their Boy Scout Aviation Merit Badge. The Girl Scouts earn one of their aviation interest uh, project badges and then the rest of the kids just have a great day uh, at the airport uh, learning about aviation. Where can people find out more information about the Youth Aviation Adventure? Well they can uh, they can go to our website which is uh, www.youthaviationadventure.org uh, and uh, from there you can learn a little bit more about the organization if you want to get in touch with us as either a volunteer or a donor, we have, uh, we have links that uh, uh, will get that job done. Now, one last thing before we wrap up. 
people can actually create a youth aviation adventure in their local area. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Uh, again, we provide all the support. We provide all the materials, including the uniforms, these patches, which the kids are awarded after the program. They can wear on their scout uniforms. Uh, everything they need, uh, phone support, uh, et cetera, to get them going. It doesn't cost them a dime. Thank you so much, Dan and Steve. Really appreciate you guys coming on other people's airplanes and talking to us about the youth aviation adventure. Well, that's a wrap, folks. We're here in uh, just on the western side of Conoco Phillips Plaza. It used to be Aeroshell Square, right in front of this amazingly beautiful airplane. Hang on, I'm just going to give you a moment. You're going to need it. Yeah, it's that good. The only flying B-29 on this planet. And uh, so many other amazing airplanes. There's a C-9, there's a KC-135, there's a Viper over there. There's a Beach Starship. I've never even seen one of those in my life. There's a whole bunch of beautiful Navy airplanes on the other side. It's just been an amazing week. Airplanes coming and going. Oh, and by the way, did you see our new Win-T t-shirts? Custom made by Win-T. Awesome stuff. Go check them out, winti.com. Amazing work that they did for us here. And, uh, you know, I think that's about it for today. We're going to come back tomorrow and bring you some more delicious aviation stuff. It's, this, is, this is the place to be. If you're not here, man, I, I, I don't know what to tell you, but we're going to keep bringing you the content. Make sure you tune in next time for more aviation goodness. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash daveflies. That's D-A-V-E-F-L-Y-S. You can also follow Damon at twitter.com slash pilot Damon. He's tweeting actually quite a bit more than I am. So make sure you're following him because he's keeping us all up to date on what's happening here on the grounds. In the meantime, make sure you check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash other people's airplanes. And until next time, uh, I'll see you guys later because I'm going to go make love to this B-29. Tasty. Woo. Not ultra light there, baby. <laughs>